In this video, we're going to look at a very common type of phonological rule called assimilation. This happens when one sound becomes similar to other sounds in its vicinity. Take a look at these two examples. In English, can't you and would you. Originally, these words have an alveolar T in contact with a palatal sound, the one at the beginning of you. So if you have an alveolar T and you have a palatal sound here, the palatal sound could pull your tongue up so that it goes into the post-alveolar region. And then you wouldn't have a T. You would have the affricate CH, as in can CH. Likewise, if you have an alveolar D followed by a palatal sound, the palatal sound would pull your tongue further back closer to the palatal. And now your tongue would not be in the alveolar position, but in the post-alveolar one. And you would get the word woodcha. Cantcha, woodcha. Where the last sound of these two is pulled back by the palatal sound. We call this process, where one sound becomes more similar to the other ones in its vicinity, assimilation. So before we look at assimilation, let's just uh, review everything we've done so far with phonological rules, make sure everything is clear. We've been looking at rules, for example, the German Ischlaut, which is the change of the palatal fricative into a velar fricative whenever the sound is preceded by a central or a back vowel. For example, the underlying form for the word book would be something like Busch. But uh, that word has a back vowel, u, followed by the fricative. And then this rule would be triggered, and it would transform this sound into the velar one, buch. Likewise, we studied the rule for Spanish lenition. So this is a fancy word for softening, because we take a stop, d, and turn it into a fricative, f, d, th, which is supposed to feel softer. So this rule says that whenever you have a D like this one, the one in lado, which means side, the D would transform, uh, would become an F because it is preceded by a vowel. And indeed, this F here has a vowel before it. So the, this environment triggers the rule and transforms the D into a softer F. So these are the parts of the rule. The first part is the class of sounds that is affected by the, by the rule, the base phoneme, such as the palatal in fricative in German and this stop in Spanish. The second part of the rule is the phonetic change that is produced by the rule, essentially the output of the rule. So you take something in and then you produce a velar fricative in German or the F in Spanish. When does this happen? whenever there is a phonological environment that triggers the rule, basically the input of the rule. So whenever you see a back vowel and the, fric and the palatal fricative, that palatal fricative is transformed into the velar. Or here, whenever you see a vowel and a D, that D is transformed into an F. So these are the parts of a phonological rule. Having reviewed that, let's uh, take a look at some common types of rules. The one that we'll uh, focus on right now is assimilation, which is changing a sound to make it resemble its neighboring sounds. We'll study the other uh, types of rules in the next video. So for now, assimilation. Here's some beautiful Italian data. And this data has, the, has two nasals in it. The alveolar nasal, and the velar nasal, the engma. So the very first thing we need to do is to try to find minimal pairs for these two sounds. Give it a shot. Please pause the video. Welcome back. So are there any words where the only difference is that one of them has N and the other one has the velar engma? Nope. There's nothing like that. Interestingly, the set does have a minimal pair, but for vowels. The words 
tengo and tengo are a minimal pair, but they're a minimal pair for e and e, not for the nasals. We were looking for a minimal pair where the only difference is that one has the n and the other one has the velar enma, velar enma. And we don't have that, so we don't have minimal pairs. The next thing we need to do is to study the environments where we find the alveolar n and the velar engma. So the, what we've been doing so far, we go through each of our words and try to figure out where we see an n. In example A, we see an n preceded by the sound e and followed by a t in tinta. In example G, we see a velar engma. It is preceded by the sound E and followed by a G, as in tingo. So please uh, grab a piece of paper and take a moment to uh, go through every word and figure out what the environments are for the N and the N. Please pause the video. Welcome back. So you should have something like this where, for example, we find the N in quite a variety of environments. We have it next to vowels, to consonants, to the edge of words. But the engma is a little bit more restricted. The en engma is surrounded by vowels, for sure, but then it is always followed by either a G or a K. And this is something that does not appear here. So these two are in complementary distribution in that the environments with the G and the K for engma never appear as environments for the N. So where, wherever you see the engma, you are never going to see the N. So these two are in complementary distribution. Here's the fun part. Is there anything in common uh, between G and K? Is there a feature that you can use to describe those two sounds. And of course there is. Both are velar sounds. They are also uh, stops, but most importantly, they are velar stops. So we could use that knowledge to try to come up with a rule. The first thing we need to do is to uh, figure out which, we're going to, which of these two we're going to choose as the base for the phoneme. And the truth is N just has more varied environments. It's probably the everywhere else case because engma is, uh, has fewer environments. Maybe it will be easier to make a rule that goes from N to engma than the other way around. So we're going to choose the alveolar one as the base phoneme. And then we're going to propose a transformation from alveolar to velar. And when is this going to happen? What is the environment that's going to trigger it? Whenever you see an N, and then right after it, you see a velar consonant, as in tingo or tengo. This environment would trigger a rule that would look something like this. An N becomes a velar engma, a velar nasal, whenever you see the N and a velar consonant like a G or a K. So what is happening here? The G and the K are velar and the N is alveolar. So your tongue is in this position, but the velars are way over here. So the velars are pushing your tongue back to the velar position. They are assimilating the nasal into the velar position. Why are they doing this? Essentially to save yourself a little bit of effort when you're moving your tongue so that the tongue is in the same position for the nasal and for the stop. We've seen other assimilation rules uh, during the week. For example, in Korean, the S transforms into ESH whenever it is followed by an E. And the, we call this palatalization because the S is in the alveolar position. The E it has the tongue fairly high up and it moves your tongue backwards into a position that is more like the one for the E. So it moves your tongue from your alveolar region into your post-alveolar region as it tries to draw it closer to where your tongue is for the E. We call this process palatalization. And as you can see, it's a form of assimilation because the E is pulling your tongue up. 
Likewise, with the Ischlaut, we have a palatal sound, which is more towards the front, and a velar sound, which is more towards the back. So the back vowel is pulling the fricative towards the back of your mouth, towards the velar region. It's essentially assimilating it. So we have several uh, common types of rules, but assimilation is a very common one, where one sound resembles the others more. Uh, for example, an N becomes velar when it is next to velar sounds. And as we saw at the beginning, in ditcha and kutcha, you could have a T and a velar T that then becomes postal velar because it is being pulled back by a palatal sound. So this is an assimilation that gives you forms like kutcha and wutcha. In the next video, we'll study more types of phonological rules.